the stories were true. The king is born. The messengers have scattered into the darkest streets. With lamps held high to broadcast the news, the season of mercy has begun. One and all, come and take this gift. God is not counting our sins against us. Receive the Savior, born and died and alive again. His life for yours, your life unending. Christmas is the first line of an invitation, not to be perfect, not to try harder, not to get it right this time but to believe and be counted among those who rest in his hands. We have not come to tell the world to do better. We sing instead of the depth of our sin and of amazing grace that runs deeper still. The stories were true. The mystery is revealed. Mercy for sinners, the Savior is born. Welcome to North Shore Fellowship Online. I'm so glad that you're here. And I wish someone else was here. I wish your friend or your colleague or your coworker or a family member. So I'm asking you to share the link. Maybe send the link to a friend or just click share. Now, we are going to have a special moment today. We're going to celebrate the Lord in worship. We're going to hear his word. And I have a very special testimony that's going to blow you away. It really will. So why don't we prepare our hearts to worship him? Let's continue to give thanks even as we move past the Thanksgiving season and into Christmas, New Year's, and on into the brand new year. Let's stay grateful and enter into his gates with thanksgiving in our hearts. And then right on into his courts with praise. Let's pray. Father, I pray that we can do that. And I pray that we could give thanks, as your scripture says, 1 Thessalonians 5.18, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Allow us to be grateful. Allow us to enter into those gates with thanksgiving and into the courts with praise. And Lord, would you speak to our hearts? You know exactly what we need. You know exactly how we feel. You know exactly how we are and who we are. So would you draw us close to you as a result of this online service today? I pray that you'll bless all that takes place and be honored by it as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's worship.
warmest greetings and welcome to you all, my online friends. It is great to be with you. Well, with Thanksgiving in the rearview mirror, it's time to start talking about Christmas. We want to invite you to come and celebrate the birth of Christ with us all month long. We're going to begin that with a special event on Saturday, December the 12th from 3 to 6 p.m. It's going to be at the Peninsula location, and it's a time we're going to get together for a tree lighting and a carol sing. What would be more Christmas than that? We're also going to be collecting coats for the homeless there, so if you have those that you'd like to donate, please bring them. We'll accept them there. We're going to have all kinds of things going on. We're going to have holiday music. We'll be singing together. We'll have the fire pit going, crafts for the kids. It's going to be a wonderful time. It is completely free. Everyone is invited. So bring your family and friends and come out and enjoy. Hey, if there's a problem with the weather on the 12th, we'll simply do it the very next day. I want to do remind you along with that, that we are going to continue our partnership with Jersey Shore Rescue Mission. We are going to be collecting gently used coats, jeans, sweatshirts, anything that would be good for the cold weather. And we will be making sure that they get to needy families and homeless people in the area. We want to remind you that our small group meetings throughout the week continue on Zoom. Let me just touch on some of the highlights to remind you. For the ladies, on Tuesday nights, that Bible study will now be an Advent study for the season. Uh, they do have a new link, so if you'd like to join them, great chance to get in on the ground floor. You just want to make sure you get the right information. And also on Tuesday, just a reminder, the youth group, now that's fifth grade and up, are meeting now on Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. on Zoom. Got to get that link also. With uh, Thursday coming up, now that we're past the Thanksgiving holiday, guys, your call will again be on. And because it's the first Thursday of the month, the marriage ministry will also be meeting. If you'd like to get together in a more live format, Facebook Live, 7 p.m. on Wednesday, Worship in the Word with Pastor Raphael and Allie. Great time to study the Word, to worship, and to pray. For our Sunday in-person services, just a reminder, at 9 a.m. we're in Peninsula Worship Service at Christ Church, and at 11 a.m. the indoor service at Bell Works in Homedale. For everybody online, of course, you should know this by now, but just in case, on Sunday, we premiere at 9 and 10.30 a.m. on both Facebook and YouTube, and the kids have their online call at 11 a.m. We do have online resources for you where you can get information and hopefully get questions answered. We have a website, we have a Facebook page, we have a YouTube channel. You can see worship, you can see sermons, you can share them with your friends. So do take advantage of the online resources that we have. Of course, if you don't want to have to listen to me every week and you'd like to get the information, if you would send your info to info at northshorenj.org, we'll email it to you a couple of times a week so you know everything that's going on. Uh, the, the thing we want you to know is if there's any question that you have, info pretty much works. It'll get that information in there and we'll be able to get you an answer. So I hope that you are all safe, happy, and well. Thank you so very much and may God bless you all. Hi, North Shore Fellowship. December is fast approaching and that means it's the beginning of the Advent season where we look step by step towards celebrating the birth of our Savior. And man, I just wish that there was a way that we could get together as a church. Hi, honey. Hey, Tasha. What's up? I'm just putting the final touches on the North Shore Fellowship Church-wide Advent devotional. Oh, that sounds good. It's a way for both campuses to be connected and for us to connect with the Lord and also with all of our people online. Well, turns out North Shore is here. Tell us all about it. Oh, hello. So it's called A Courageous Christmas, and it comes with this booklet, and each day has a Bible reading or a devotional, and every week focuses on a different character from the Advent. And there is a chart here with stickers. And stickers? Yeah, stickers. See? I love stickers. Here, then that's for you and um, a scripture memory card. And it's all contained and there's some games and things like that in here too. Well, that sounds great, but I have one question. Yes. What if you're not coming out to one of the services? What if you're joining North Shore online? Is there a way that we can share it with them? Sure. Just send us your information at info at northshorenj.org and we'll send you a hard copy or we will send you a PDF if you send us your email address. 
Um, the other thing I wanted to say is that this is not just for families. If you are home and you are alone, this is a great thing for you to do. And you can call a friend and meet up you know, every day or once a week to go through this devotional with them. I think it'd be really enriching. Sounds good to me. We'll see you online, church. Hey friends, I want to take this opportunity during the Thanksgiving season to thank all of you who have been faithful in giving to North Shore Fellowship. Your tithes and your offerings have sustained us through these tough times and God has used you to reach many people for the kingdom through this church. We're still facing challenges, all of us are, this time of year as we budget for the next year. And the only way we'll be able to continue to fully move forward is for all of us to continue to give faithfully and generously to the vision and the mission of North Shore Fellowship. And that's preaching the gospel. It's leading people to Jesus. It's, it's leading people in worship. It's reaching the lost. It's ministering to the children. It's caring for the needs of the poor and being faithful to teach the word of God, the word of truth, especially in the face of a society where there's so much deception. I'd like to ask you if you would consider an end of the year gift to North Shore Fellowship. Now we know these are tough times for all of us, but there are those of you who are able to give a tax-free end of the year gift. And I wanna ask you if you would continue to give towards the North Shore Fellowship, our mission in spreading the gospel and sharing the love of Jesus and bringing the kingdom of God here in New Jersey, just like it is in heaven. Thank you and happy Thanksgiving. Let's pray. Lord, I pray for the offering. I pray for those men and women who are giving faithfully and tithing. I pray that you'll bless them, bless their finances, bless their health, bless their children, bless their lives. And I also pray that you'll bless the church and that you'll use every penny for the mission of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that we would go forward out of this year and into next year, declaring your word, worshiping you with all that is within us and sharing the word of truth and the gospel of peace to everyone whom we can. I pray that you'll provide for us and bless all the gifts and bless the givers as well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Welcome, everyone. Let's pray. Oh, Lord God, thank you so much for your unconditional love for us. Thank you, Lord, that you forgive us. You forgive us so freely through what Jesus did on the cross. We're so grateful, God, that you have given us freedom in Jesus and that you've also given us your peace and your rest. Lord, we're grateful for that. And Lord, we need your peace more than ever in these days. So we are coming before you with our requests, Lord. And we just keep bringing the COVID crisis to you, Lord. We pray, God, that you would just continue to intervene and that it would just disappear and dissipate, Lord. Lord, we are also praying uh, about the unrest in our nation and in the world. Lord, we do pray, God, that you would just help us to be agents of your peace. We just want to see peace in our nation and we want it to be because of you, Lord. We are praying for revival. We'll continue to pray for revival, Lord. You, Lord, would you use us for revival in our country and in the world? Lord, we're also bringing before you the ones that are sick, Lord. There's so much healing that is needed right now, Lord. Would you just bring your healing, God? And Lord, for the hopeless and the struggling, God, would you just bring your hope? Help them to know that they have a hope and a future because of you, Jesus. We love you so much, Lord. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you need prayer for anything, please reach out to us. You can email us at prayer at northshorenj.org. Well, friends, we're concluding the 10-month journey, Eyes on Jesus, which is a study of the Gospel of Mark. And we have been through it from the very beginning, the earliest chapters of Mark, until this week. We went past the crucifixion, past the resurrection, and then finally we are going to end our journey ah, on these final words, a final commission from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when we end with the final chapter of Mark, which is chapter 16, we're faced with two endings. Uh, some of you have studied Mark know that there's two accepted endings of the book of Mark. And here's why. The reason for that, there's a short ending and a long ending. The reason for that is, is that the earliest manuscripts, those documents, those scrolls that they found of copies of the apostles' writings, they vary in the length of the, particularly the Gospel of Mark chapter 16. And so when they are looking for ancient scriptures to build the, our Bible on, the Holy Bible, particularly the New Testament, they went looking for the earliest documents that they could find. And it's amazing the preserva preservation of early documents that built what we know as the Brit Hadashah or the New Testament. And so what they did is they found the earliest collections of authenticated writings um, now remember, we don't have original autographs of any of the books of the Bible. Autographs means the original handwriting from the prophet or the apostle or the writer, whoever it might be. But what we do have is very early copies of those writings. The earliest manuscripts are two. One is called is the, is the Codex Vaticanus and the other one is the Codex Sinaiticus. And these are very early writings, mid fourth century, meaning they probably existed or were written around 320 to 350 AD. Now that's relatively recent to uh, the, the actual happenings of the New Testament. And remember, there's no modern presses at this time. Everything is meticulously hand scribed and hand copied. Uh, other early writings that came about were co compiled very uh, brilliantly in an early collection called the Vulgate, or some people call it the Latin Vulgate. It's what we know as the Textus Receptus, the documents that the early uh, versions of the New Testament were built upon. And this took place by a person by the name of Jerome of Stridon, known in Catholic circles as Saint Jerome. And he undertook this amazing project of getting all of the known texts in Latin and translating them meticulously and accurately into Greek. So many of our Bibles are built on his work. Others that 
probably more modern of the newer translations were able to access earlier works and were built upon the Codex Vaticanus or the Codex Sinaiticus. Uh, it's a lot of information. I took a course with Harvard University and it was called the Christ Christianity Through Its Scriptures. And you think I gave you a lot of information there. It's, there are tons of volumes of information which is the reason why there's so many debates about things like the first and second endings of Mark. And I don't want to get into those debates because they're well-founded and there's wonderful people, brilliant people who believe uh, in both sides or favor each of the versions, the shorter and the longer. Well, I did find in that course, <laughs> what really amazed me and I, I hope it amazed every other student and professor is that there was a tremendous amount of harmony and agreement. The scriptures, were so congruent, so consistent with one another for writers that didn't even know each other, didn't even, were not even aware in some cases of each other's work or writings, and yet brilliantly harmonizing, synchronized to give us the truth of the divinely inspired word of God. I am amazed by that. Now back to the book of Mark, because we're finishing up today. And you'll see that one, your Bible may end in Mark 16, 8. Other Bibles may go on to Mark 16, 20. Um, and why is that? Well, some people believe that the extension, verses 9 through 20, uh, were probably a, a, a later writing, whether it was written by John Mark, who wrote the Gospel of Mark, or by Peter, whose story John Mark was telling. And some people believe Peter said, hey, let's not just end it there. Let's add, with the resurrection, let's add some more of what Jesus did and said after the resurrection. No one knows for sure, but I'll tell you what, the last chapter of Mark 16 is very inspiring. It's very powerful, just like the rest of the chapters in Mark's study. So we are gonna read it with understanding and ask the Holy Spirit to illuminate it to us and to show us what is intended, what, what God has for us, the living word. And I want to encourage you to do that with every Bible reading. Bible reading is not just taking information from pages of written material and, and depositing them into your intellect. That is just the beginning. It becomes illuminated when the Holy Spirit shines light upon it and applies it. It's a living word, living and active. So we're going to approach this last chapter of Mark through looking at the eye, through the eyes of Jesus, having the eyes of Jesus, keeping our eyes on Jesus as our series title names. And we're gonna finish up Mark. You ready for this? Mark 16, nine through 20. We're looking at Mark 16, nine through 20, and that which takes place after the resurrection in Jesus' final commission. When Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him and who were mourning and weeping. When they heard that Jesus was alive and she had seen him, they did not believe. Afterwards, Jesus appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking in the country. These returned and reported it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Later, Jesus appeared to the 11 as they were eating. He rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. Now initially, as we saw, he appears to Mary Magdalene. Magdalene. Mary Magdalene was a faithful follower of Jesus, even though she came from a very bad reputation. She was infested with seven demons and the Lord delivered her. So it's likely that as they were reverting to their doubt, maybe because they were traumatized by what they saw in the crucifixion, Jesus being tortured, Jesus being whipped, Jesus being crucified, Maybe they got scared and reverted, and maybe they even started to doubt, not just Jesus, but Mary Magdalene as well. So they didn't believe at first, Jesus had to rebuke them. Then we pick it up in verse 15, and he said to them, this is after he shows himself, he says to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Now, this is Mark's version of the Great Commission, Jesus' marching orders to us. Uh, the, the more popular and the more well-known and well-articulated uh, and, and uh, memorized version is Mark 
um, I'm sorry, Matthew, Matthew's version, 28 verse 19. And you'll recognize this. This is the Great Commission according to Matthew. And it really corresponds, not identically, but listen. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. Okay, so far we see him in this, this le- second ending of Mark. He reveals himself to the apostles, rebukes them for their unbelief. He gives them a charge to go out and preach the gospel to all creation. And now for the last three chapters, I'm sorry, the last three verses, it gets really wild. <laughs> so, so hang on and let's finish this up. There's details in the final verses of Mark that don't necessarily correspond with the goings on of the New Testament. They actually are, seem to be more uh, in line with the experiences that the apostles had in the book of Acts. And I'll explain in a second. Verse 17, and these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. Wow. Now that's just verses 17 and 18. We have a couple more before we end the book of Mark. But those verses, did you hear what we just said? He listed these signs that will accompany, or in some versions you'll see say follow, the believers. And here's what they are. Number one, to drive out demons. Number two, to speak in new tongues. Number three, to pick up snakes. Number four, to drink deadly poison and not be hurt. And number five, to place hands on sick people and heal them. So I want to just look at each of these things that Jesus put forth in these two verses. First, he says, drive out demons. Well, we do see them do that. In fact, it's a common occurrence for Jesus to drive out many demons, but also the apostles did that, particularly Paul in Acts 16 and 19. So there was, there was a lot of driving out of demons after Jesus went on to, be with the, to ascend to be with the Father. Then he says, speak in new tongues. Speak in new tongues. Well, there's, this is evidenced in a couple, probably a few uh, incidents in the, again, in the book of Acts. Uh, in Acts chapter 2, we see the miracle of languages. You remember when the apostles were praising God and people from many different dialects and different languages were able to hear what they had to say, this miracle of languages. But also the speaking in tongues, which we see in Acts 10, we see in Acts 19. It's explained in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, particularly 12 and 14. And so these are another, this is another thing that we did see come to pass. Next one is pick up snakes, pick up snakes. Now it's getting really wild. Jesus said, you'll pick up snakes. What does that mean? Are we gonna be snake handlers? Well, you think about it. In in Acts 28, Paul was shipwrecked on the island of Malta. He's a prisoner going to Rome and he's shipwrecked. And so they're trying to keep warm by the fire. Paul gets some brush from the the woods and, and throws it on the fire to keep the fire going. And out of it, a snake comes and attaches to his arm, a venomous snake. The locals knew this snake and attaches to Paul's arm. And Paul takes the snake and he just tosses it into the fire and it didn't harm him. The poison didn't harm him. Actually, the locals looked at him and said, whoa, if he's not already dead, he must be a god. And they started to worship him. The next one that says, drink deadly poison and not be hurt. I have to be honest with you. I don't see a biblical example of this. Doesn't mean it didn't happen. There's a lot of things that took place that was, were not written down in Jesus' life alone. John, the last chapter of John tells us that not everything was written. So it could have happened, but I won't pretend I know when or where it did. And then the fifth one, to place hands on sick people and heal them. Now, there's many instances in Acts and beyond of people laying hands on sick people or blind people or lame people and them being healed. And sometimes where they didn't even lay a hand on them, sometimes a shadow or a cloth would heal someone who's sick. The power that God would use to to heal people. Listen, when Ananias first was summoned by the Holy Spirit to go and, you know, talk to Saul of Tarsus, who was a Christian killer. He wanted to persecute those that believe in Jesus as Messiah. Ananias bravely went to Saul of Tarsus, laid his hand on him in Acts 9, and healed him of blindness. God healed him through Ananias. 
back in that story about Malta when I told you about where, they, where Paul got bit by the snake and threw it in the fire and they all worshiped him. Well, the chief of that island, uh, his father was gravely ill and Paul went to him and he laid his hand on him and guess what? He was healed. And after that happened, lots of people came to Paul and, and were healed. So the healings were taking place, clearly. And James tells us if you're sick, if there's someone sick among you, have them come to the elders of the church so that we can anoint you with oil, pray a prayer of faith that you might be healed. And never miss an opportunity to allow us to pray a prayer of faith to, that God would heal you of any sickness or disease. So sometimes where people were healed and delivered in these ways and sometimes other ways. I, I think about Philip. Philip. Uh, who you know we know is an evangelist who went from place to place but he was think about the miracles that took place to him in Acts chapter 8 verses 5 through 7 it says Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached now keep in mind that's why he went there and that's what he did keep that in the back of your mind he preached Christ to them and the multitudes with one accord heeded the the things spoken by Philip hearing and seeing miracles which he did Unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. So you see these works follow the apostles, follow the believers as they went forth after Jesus ascended and they preached and these things happened. And now we come to the final verse, final verses I should say, there's two, of our journey. Eyes on Jesus, the study of the Gospel of Mark started in Mark 1.1, 1, 1, and we're going to end in Mark 16, 19 through 20. How does that make you feel? Well, it should make you feel fantastic based on what I'm about to say. This is the final words that were given to John Mark as he wrote this gospel. Mark 16, 19 through 20. After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven, and he sat at the right hand of God. Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere. And the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. Amen. <laughs> what happened? What did it conclude with? These things. It said they preached everywhere. The Lord worked with them and confirmed his words by signs that accompanied them. It's amazing. Jesus sent them out with the power that he invested and imparted in them to do, he even by his own words said, greater things. And many more people, thousands and thousands were affected. And we have to believe that, that thousands were healed and, and, being, and been delivered of demons and things like that. They went out with power. Now, just like Jesus used these methods and many more, so did the apostles after him. But there wasn't one set method for healing or casting out a demon. It was not methodology. It was responding in obedience and allowing God to do the work. There's not one method for praying for people to be healed. There's not one method for deliverance of a demon. There's not even one method for evangelism. There's not even one method for worship. What matters is what's in our heart and the Holy Spirit moving in us and through us and around us. You see, it's, it's the Holy Spirit's job to do these miracles. And he does it when he wills and how he wills. It's not up to us, it's up to him. Our job, as we see very clearly here, is to preach the gospel and let God do the miracles. We preach, let God do his thing. In Jesus' final commission, and let's add commissions, not just with Mark, but let's throw Matthew and Luke in there as well. His marching orders, the final commissions, as we saw, well, in Matthew, it said to go and make disciples of all nations. And what we just saw in Mark, it says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And then Luke says to preach his name to all nations. And then in Acts 1.8, when Jesus is being lifted up in, in his ascension, it's, he says, you will, be, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts the uttermost parts. That's the commission. That's our job. Those are our last instructions, marching orders. But what about signs and wonders? When are they going to come? Where do they come? How do you make them come? How do you find them? How do you seek them? Tell me about signs and wonders. Well, I have a question for you. Should we follow signs and wonders or should they follow us? 
Mark 16, 17 says this in the New King James Version. And these signs will follow those who believe. You see, many Christians answer that wrong. Many Christians get it backwards. Many seek signs and wonders. They're seeking signs and wonders. They want to solidify their faith. They want to galvanize their belief in God's favor and power. But they never seem to see enough or experience enough of them to satiate that appetite for the proof of God's existence. And so they begin to doubt and they struggle and eventually that becomes unbelief. Friends, don't follow that trap. Don't seek signs and wonders. Seek Jesus. Do his will. Do what he tells you to do and watch what happens. Again, that final verse of Mark, and this is in the King James Version. It says, Mark 16, 20, And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Signs following them, not them following signs. In other words, go and preach everywhere and let the Lord do his work. I know we all want to see God move mightily in our time. I definitely do. And we want to see miraculous signs. I definitely do I want to see miracles. And I want to see them accompany us who are, who are doing the work of the gospel and preaching the gospel. But the problem is, if we seek signs, we won't find them. Matthew tells us, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all, everything you need will, will be added to you or follow you. Sometimes people get it confused. And sometimes they confuse signs and wonders with supernatural gifts. Because sometimes they're the same, but not always. Supernatural gifts imparted in us and signs and wonders that God does all around us, manifestations, they're not always the same. But some say, well, doesn't the Bible say to seek spiritual gifts? I've heard that before, and it's a very innocent mistake. But what it's hap- what's happening there is, is they're taking 1 Corinthians 14.1, and they're just changing one or two words. 1 Corinthians 14.1 says something like that. But it says to desire spiritual gifts. And desire is different than seek. You could look it up. Every version of of, uh, 1 Corinthians 14.1, every major version will say desire, but not to seek, not to seek spiritual gifts. In fact, 1 Corinthians 14.1 actually starts with something that it does say to pursue, and that's love. It says, pursue love and earnestly desire spiritual gifts. Pursue love and earnestly desire spiritual gifts. If you want to pursue something, pursue love. That's first and foremost. If you want to seek something, seek Jesus. And if those things are true in you, you're pursuing love, you're seeking Jesus, then you will love people enough to seek Jesus so much that you'll find yourself preaching the good news to those whom he wants to save because he loves them. And watch what happens. If you follow and focus these things, perhaps, perhaps, signs and wonders will follow. Well, that's what happened with the apostles and the the believers in the early church. Seek the kingdom. Seek Jesus. Now, what about spiritual gifts? Because sometimes they're confused with signs and wonders, sometimes in the same category. I love the writings of A.W. Tozer. A.W. Tozer was a man that lived about 100 years ago, wrote in the early part of last century, very well-known theologian, and if you don't know, was a prominent leader in the Christian Missionary Alliance. He's a Christian and Missionary Alliance pastor, and he was a writer, and he was a leader in the denomination, and wrote a lot and influenced a lot of what our doctrine is built upon. Now, our founder, Christian Missionary Alliance, is A.B. Simpson, a man that A.W. Tozer greatly respected. And he often wrote about A.W. Simpson's experiences, even with supernatural gifts. And one phrase that he came up with that's closely associated uh, with our denomination is this, seek not, forbid not. Now this is particularly talking about uh, spiritual gifts. And in some ways you you can apply this to signs and wonders. Seek not, forbid not. What does that mean? It means you don't seek them, as we just clearly pointed out from 1 Corinthians 14.1 but you don't forbid them either. You're not rejecting spiritual gifts or the supernatural, but you don't turn around and seek them instead of seeking Jesus, whom we're told to seek. They follow. They follow. 
as we live our lives, God puts us, he, God puts us in these situations. And I hope that happens more and more as the days get darker and the light gets lighter. But he puts us in situations. And in this, those, those situations, if we're obedient, just simply obedient to follow his simple leading. Now, I'm not talking about these great spiritual exploits, but you and I, as we go along our day, doing normal mundane things even, as we are obedient to the work and leading of God and are willing to take a few simple steps of faith and keep our spiritual eyes open for what's happening around us, I believe this, that God will do amazing things. He'll do amazing things and sometimes even miracles. Sometimes even miracles. I want you to listen to this short testimony of something that happened to Michael Matt who is one of our worship leaders at North Shore West. And Michael told me this story and I was so amazed and delighted of just a simple thing that happened to him in a parking lot here in Monmouth County. So give your attention to Michael as he shares what happened to him that where God did something fantastic, amazing. Hi, I just wanted to share a story um, and a testimony of uh, something that happened to me today. Um, you know, with everything going on with the virus and confinement, uh, you know, a lot of things run through your head. You worry through, worry about bills and work and, and um, you know, uh, health, obviously. And um, today I just kind of wanted to get out of the house and just kind of get my head away from things and, you know, just go anywhere, basically. And I, I uh, had something I had to return to Lowe's. So I got my car, drove to Lowe's, and I was listening to Christian music on the way. And uh, just trying to get my head, you know, off of all the things going on and uh, kind of praying in my head that, uh, you know, things will get better. And uh, I pulled into Lowe's parking lot in Howell. And as I turned, made a right hand turn into the lot, I noticed that there was a car in the middle of the intersection. It was just stopped. Um, cars were trying to get around it. And as I drove past the front windshield of the car, I looked in and uh, saw a person slumped back in their seat. And uh, the car wasn't going anywhere. So I pulled my car over. It was raining out, got out, and kind of ran over to the car. I was banging on the windows, and the person was unresponsive. Um, I could see that they weren't breathing, and uh, their face was kind of turning blue. Um, we, uh, a couple other people came over, and, uh, you know, we were trying to get into the car. Couldn't get in the car. We tried breaking the window. Couldn't break the window. Uh, we got some cinder blocks and I propped them up in front of the wheels because I noticed the car was in drive. And um, we were trying to get in the car. We yelled for someone immediately to call 911. And uh, a couple minutes later, I guess it was pretty quickly, uh, some police arrived, the ambulance, and uh, got up to the car. Um, I then went ahead and started directing traffic because there were cars all over in the ambulance and police cars were I would have had trouble getting in. So I was directing traffic to get cars out of the way to give room for uh, EMS to, uh, to get in there. Uh, they got the person out of the car. They had him laying on the ground behind me a short distance, and they were working on him. I could hear them, you know, calling off the, um, the paddles and things like that, trying to get his heart going. And um, I was directing traffic for, sh for a short period of time, maybe 10 minutes, and uh, police eventually blocked off traffic and the police officer called me over and asked if I witnessed what happened. I gave him my information and uh, I guess that was another couple more minutes. So by this point, I'm, I'm guessing that maybe the person was, was not breathing or uh, and had no heart rate for about 10 or, 10 or 15 minutes, I'm guessing. I don't know, the time went by pretty quick. And I asked the officer how he was doing and the officer said he wasn't doing well, that uh, he wasn't breathing, there was no heart rate. And uh, they must have tried the paddles, I'm guessing, maybe, I don't know, two, three, four times. And uh, I was pretty upset. I mean, he was right there on the ground by me, and um, it was pretty upsetting. And I, I went over, and uh, my only thought was I extended my hand out over him, and uh, I said a prayer. And I said, uh, I said, God, please don't let this person die. I said, Jesus, please intervene and breathe life into this person. Don't let this person die today. And um, as I said it with my hand out extended, the person gasped for air. And they yelled out that they had a heart rate. And I, 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 I was speechless. I just, um, 
I, I couldn't believe that that actually had just happened. And um, I, the officer came over and, you know, it said to me, I, you know, I could leave. And I said, and he thanked me for, you know, being there and, and helping out. And I said, well, it's not, it's not me. It was, um, I just prayed over, I just extended my hand, prayed to Jesus. And this person just breathed. Um, that's not me. And, um, and the officer said, well, whatever it was, he, you know, he's breathing again. So, um, you know, I, I just wanted to share that story. I, I kind of walked away at that point. I'm hoping that the person's okay. Um, they did put him into the ambulance. I don't know the outcome. I'm hoping he's okay. But, you know, even if he was not okay, the thought that, you know, I was there and, and prayed that prayer. And, um, you know, maybe that gasp of air was that breath of life um, meant a lot to me. And, uh, and I'm hoping it means a lot to him. I'm hoping he's okay. Um, I kind of went into lows after that and some people were talking to me about it and I shared the same story with them as I'm sharing with you. Um, you know, some people believe, some people don't believe. If I could tell this story and have one more person believe that maybe he was questioning before this, then that's a great thing. Um, I thought of the movie, there's a show called The Chosen and Jesus is talking to the woman at the uh, at the uh, well and um, tells her to share her story. And so I'm sharing my story. Um, that person was purple in the face, did not breathe for a good amount of time, no heart rate, no response to the paddles. And I put my hand out and prayed and he gasped for air. So, um, I thank Jesus and, uh, and I know I believe, and I don't think things happen for no reason at all. And I hope that this story means something to someone and, uh, and they take something away from it that, uh, is a faith in Jesus and a belief in Jesus. And that's it. Thank you. Wow. Wasn't that amazing? I hear that story every time I hear it, I'm so much more filled with awe and how incredible that our Lord is, how amazing he can still be from someone who's just obediently faithful to follow the simple leading of the Holy Spirit. And I believe that can happen more and more to you and I. My hope is that it does. God is an amazing God. He wants to amaze us and he wants us to do amazing things. You know, if we humbly and obediently follow his will, I think there's no limit to the things that he can do through us, in us, around us, for us. In fact, as we close our study of the book of Mark, the gospel of Mark, one thing is very evident to me as I read this this time is how amazing the Lord is and how amazed people were by him. In fact, if you look at the gospel of Mark, one of the one of the labels you can call it is the amazing book of Mark, or just simply amazement of Jesus. In Mark 1.22, the people were amazed by his teaching, it says. It says in Mark 1.27, they reiterated, they reiterated their amazement for his teaching and his command of the unclean spirits. In Mark 2.12, it shows that people were amazed not only his healing, but the types of healing that he was doing, including the paralytic. In 5.20, we were amazed after Jesus healed the demoniac and the Gerasenes. In 6.2, remember this? People were amazed again at his teaching. In the same chapter, they were amazed that he's walking on water, which is really amazing. Uh, Mark 7.37, crowds had gone back and because they were delighted and amazed at Jesus healing a deaf man. There's so much more. 11.18, 12.17, amazed at his teaching. 15.5, uh, there's a new person that's amazed. That's Pilate. Pilate is amazed at Jesus' response and the lack of response when he was, uh, wouldn't even defend himself. He's silent like a lamb. And then 16.8, we read this in the final chapter. The final verse of the first ending of Mark is this. So they went quickly and fled from the tomb for they trembled and were amazed. God is an amazing God. God is an amazing God, and he wants to do miracles among us. He wants to use us in amazing ways. And what do we need to do? We need to be obedient to the things that Jesus commanded us to do when he left us to ascend to be with the Father. And so we close 
this series, Eyes on Jesus, and this journey through the Gospel of Mark by not just keeping our eyes on Jesus, but our ears to hear what he has to say as he leaves us with this beautiful commission to go forth. And here's what it says. Again, I repeat the last verses of Mark, Mark 16, 20. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming his word with signs following. Amen. Amen. Let's keep our eyes on Jesus. Let's make disciples. Let's be his witnesses. Let's preach the gospel. And let's prepare to be amazed.
Well, thank you for being with us. And once again, happy Thanksgiving and happy holidays. I want you to do something. I want you to really savor what you heard today. Allow the Lord to speak to your heart and permeate your heart and be willing to go forth. Maybe it's just simply being willing to pray for someone, a stranger perhaps. Maybe it's simply speaking the word of good news, the gospel to someone. But be willing to take that next step and watch what happens. I really believe God wants to do great things. If you've never given your life to Jesus, then I want you to contact us, call us, email us, click us through Facebook. Allow us to usher you into a prayer of salvation. And if there's any other needs that you may have, reach out to us. Don't feel alone this holiday season because you're not. Jesus is here with you and we are here for you. So thank you for being with us at North Shore Fellowship. Have a fantastic holiday season and we'll just see you next week. God bless you.